Oh, hello everybody, me, The Vern here, Cinema Recall Podcast, doing a quick little video for our YouTube subscribers. These are random thoughts of a movie Insomniac. These are just going to be really short little reviews of movies that I watched recently. Uh, don't forget to check out our podcast, Cinema Recall. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Stitcher, Spotify, all that shit right there. Um, but let's get into right now. These are just movies that I saw recently that I wanted to give small little takes on. So the first movie that I'm going to be showing you is, you can see that right there, Terminator Genesis. I think this is the fifth in the series. And this one takes place during the course of the first movie. Uh, basically, you know the story. Uh, John Connor sends Kyle Reese from the future to the year 1984 to protect his mother, Sarah Connor, from the Terminator. But in this one, Sarah Connor comes looking for Kyle Reese, and she's there with the Terminator, and she tells Kyle Reese that they have to go to this other year to protect the past or the future from of Skynet taking control of everything. And they jump the shark majorly in this one because in this movie, you find out that John Connor, and sorry, spoilers here from on all of these movies here, but you find out that John Connor is actually working with Skynet the whole time, and he's the reason why uh, Skynet gets started, and he's working with uh, Miles Dyson's son from the T2 movie, and it, it just does not make any lick of sense why they would jump the shark on this one. Just really bad. Really bad stuff. And if the whole movie took place in 1984 and just would have stayed there, you know, kind of like how in Back to the Future Part 2, when Martin McFly goes back to 1955 and he's trying to, you know, prevent his past self from seeing his future self, just do something in that world. The first 10 minutes of the movie was set in 1984 and they have like new Terminators come in to try and stop Kyle and you know, maybe kill Sonner, kill Sarah Connor. That was cool. But yeah, avoid at all costs. Uh, I bought this for really cheap, so I don't mind losing money on it. Goodbye. All right, so the next one on our list is John Carpenter's Village of the Damned. I hope you can see that well. Yes, uh, this is a remake of the 1960 movie of the same name. And the storyline involves this comet or this eclipse that passes over the small town. Everyone in the town falls asleep, and then after they wake up, all the women in the town are unexpectedly pregnant, and they give birth to these kids with white hair, and all these kids have psychic abilities, and they make the adults do things that they don't want to do, they can read minds, and then you find out that these kids are an alien species who are trying to take over the world. I think it works better in the original version that it does in this one because the original uh, is British and I'm not trying to say that all kids who are British are creepy but for some reason in the original with that very you know elegant um, you know language and everything like that it just comes off as being more creepy than it does in the remake and the remake was directed by John Carpenter but if you never knew that, you would have no idea that it was a John Carpenter movie. Now, the cast in the remake is kind of cool because you got, like, uh, who is it now? Christopher Reeve. You got Superman Christopher Reeve while he still can walk, and that's cool to see. Uh, you got Christy Alley from Cheers. You got Mark Hamill from Star Wars. He plays priest in this. Yeah, it's, it's okay, but being the fact that this was an updated version of the 1960 version. I would I was expecting a little more gore in this one and there really isn't that. In fact, I'm really kind of surprised that this movie's rated R because it's more PG-13 than R capabilities. So it, it's not bad, it's, it's definitely not worse. I guess what I don't like about this movie is the fact that it has a really strong buildup with the characters, and the situations, and it really takes time to let you know about all the characters in this, and it builds up this world, and when the children are introduced, uh, they, they, you slowly start to see their powers, and then it just ends 
abruptly. It just ends with an explosion and just kind of BS right there. So yeah, Village of the Damned, it, take it or leave it there, but I would go with the original one first of all, all right? Now, the next one on my list is one that is seemed to be very controversial to a lot of people who have seen it. I know a lot of uh, people that I read and respect, they tell me to avoid this movie at all costs and that it's disgusting and it's depraved and I had to watch it. I did. And my next movie that I watched is Salo or 120 Days of Sodom. And yes, I get the initial concept of the movie is really kind of gross because the initial concept involves these fascist leaders who kidnap this group of children and they bring them to this hotel slash prison where they abuse, torture, and rape them for several days. And that initial concept is gross and disgusting in of itself there. But what makes this movie somewhat fascinating is the fact that you do not get any insights into the people who are doing the torturing and the people who are being tortured. Uh, it's almost like you're seeing just, I don't want to say just people being just mean to each other for no reason. Um, for me, it kind of has a political statement about the way that we can be treated by higher ups because in this movie, they do some deplorable things to these kids. But a lot of the times, these kids just seem to accept it and they just seem to go with it. There's a scene where they give these kids, you know, shit to eat. Not actual real shit, but it's meant to look like shit. And while some of the kids are against this, a lot of them just kind of take it. And to me, it seems to represent how, you know, people who are kind of like, you know, deemed to be lower class will just take things that are given to them. Even though they don't like it, they'll just say, well, it's something. I guess I don't like this at all, but I guess I have no choice. I'll have to do this. And just kind of that aspect of it. And when I first heard about this movie, I was expecting something really grisly and hardcore, like a horror film. And the movie begins with this light-hearted comedic tone. The music was by Ennio Martino. Ennio Martino. I'm gonna mess up the name. I apologize. But he did the music for The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly and most recently, The Hateful Eight. And so when I heard this kind of like light, comedic, kind of happy little tune on top of this movie that's supposed to be so depraved, yeah, it was slightly jarring and confusing. And I know there's a lot more political aspects in this movie. I know that the director of this, uh, what's the name here? Uh, Pierre Pablo Pasolini was murdered before this movie was released, or at least during the time of its release. And there's like a huge booklet of facts about the movie from other film stars. I'm not gonna show you the actual book because there are disturbing images from the movie. So yeah, so it's disturbing in its concept, but not so much its execution, is what I mean to say about this movie. Even the more grisly, violent scenes that happen at the end of this, you can tell that it's all Kind of fake. I mean, scene where like a ton is cut out is fake. There's a scene where a guy's member is burned and you can see it's a fake member. So yeah, shocking, but not as shocking as I was expecting to believe it. Hmm. So yeah, so that was uh, Solo or 120 Days of Sodom. Now a movie, the last pick I have here is a movie that I think is even more shocking than that one right there. Uh, more disturbing, more people to watch than Solo. Uh, last one on the list here is Spider-Man Far From Home and I just want to call this one basically Peter Parker is on vacation and can't really talk to girls because the whole concept of Spider-Man Far From Home is that Peter Parker wants to go on vacation to Italy and he wants to plan this moment when he's going to tell MJ how he feels and he bought this, you know, jewelry that he thinks she'll like. But the whole time, he just can't seem to talk to her and he gets really jealous 
and Adri when she's talking to another guy. Uh, he gets these powers from Tony Stark, uh, who passed away during the last Avengers movie. I can't remember the name of it. I think it's like Last Crusade or End Endgame, Avengers Endgame. And so he gets he gets, he gets these powers from Tony Stark to protect the world. And what does he use it for? He uses it, to, uh, you know, stop another guy from talking to the girl that he likes. He's this really, I don't know, very much a creepy kind of stalker guy, super jealous, and just did not seem to match Peter Parker at all. Now, I was a big fan of Homecoming. Homecoming was really, 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 really good. A lot of fun. Um, the villains were good. Peter Parker is good. Aunt May, all the characters were great. What irritates me the most, well, not irritates, there's a lot of things that irritates me about Far From Home. Mainly the fact that at the end of Homecoming, when Aunt May discovers that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, and she has that, what the, and then it goes right to the credits, that's brilliant. But in Far From Home, uh, she seems to be cool that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. It seems that all the other characters seem to know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So at the end credit sequence, when, uh, was it now, the Mysterio guy exposes Peter Parker, it's not that scary. And the character of Mysterio himself, Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, yeah, so basically in this movie you find out that Spider-Man meets this guy called Mysterio and he's stopping these uh, creature elements from destroying the world. And so Peter Parker thinks that Mysterio or the guy behind the mask is going to be the new Tony Stark. And it turns out that he's just uh, a disgruntled employee who's been upset that he was fired from Tony Stark Company. And so him and a bunch of other disgruntled employees decided to stage fake attacks to make him look like the hero, the Mysterio character. And then you find out that, was it like, um, Nick Fury and people from S.H.I.E.L.D. want to help him out and then they want to help destroy him. And then at the very end of the movie, you find out that Nick Fury and other cohorts were just scrolls. And all the Avengers are fine, or all the members of S.H.I.E.L.D. are fine. They're on vacation somewhere. And just really kind of BS and the whole thing about the whole thing about the blip because apparently in end of game when the Avengers killed off Thanos you know all the people who were destroyed by Thanos in Infinity War they come back and some of them are older or some of them have changed and it addresses that element for about maybe two minutes five minutes and then it's just done <sighs> okay going on too much about this movie but Big sin about Spider-Man Far From Home, I had to wait 90 minutes, 90 effing minutes for Spider-Man to show up in this movie. That is just not right. That is BS right there. All right, so that's it. Those are the movies that I watched. Uh, give us your thoughts. Let us know what you thought about these. Um, we are available, like I said before, on podcast network apps, but we're available also on social media. Please check out Cinema Recall Podcast on Twitter. We are on Twitter at Cinema underscore recall and then facebook instagram we are cinema recall podcast uh that's it for right now we'll be back on a podcast front of the show i'm sure we will be um gonna take a small little hiatus because we are starting production on our night of the living dead audio drama very very excited for you to hear that once it's done it probably won't be done till the end of july maybe the end of August, all right? But that's it right now. Thank you all for listening. Uh, our website is cinemarecall.net. All right, take care, everybody. Goodbye.